everyone. Welcome to another video by Fortune Buchholz of NotFortuneSchool.com and uh, this video is going to be the unboxing of Chiro Marchetti's new Kipper deck, the Fin de Siecle Kipper. Um, so as you know, I've been a friend of um, Chiro's for a long time and I've really had that privilege and so I was one of the three readers that Cheryl asked to contribute some of my thoughts and writings to his companion booklet for the deck. So when you buy this deck and you download the companion PDF, you'll see my thoughts about the Kipper, why I view the Kipper as a 19th century psychological novel, and how that affects the way that I read Kipper. You'll also see my own personal meanings, which are largely derived from the traditional German meanings. Uh, that I learned when I was uh, traveling and living in German-speaking countries and from my German-speaking friends who are also readers. So I have that German orientation and I just want to lay that out. And so the remarks that I make in the companion document and of course here in this video will reflect my German experiences, my views of the cards. You may find them to be somewhat different. They may work a little differently uh, for you but, you know, in general, there is some sort of basic alignment in the Kipper system. And so while, you know, there may be some differences and we may, you know, think about the cards in slightly different ways as we use the flexible, direct, accessible, and modern Kipper system, in general, they will be in harmony with how other German readers and the overall German experience work, right? Um, so that's going to be, you know, my outlook. Uh, where I'm coming from and I just wanted to lay that out for you straight you know to the front right there before we get started so here we are I was very excited this afternoon when what came in the mail was the beautiful Chiro Marchetti Keeper deck I wasn't expecting it as you know Chiro has had some production problems that is his wife has been sewing the bags literally by hand and that's amazing because the response to this deck was so overwhelming Right, there's been kind of a backlog on that, and of course Chiro's had some family problems. You know, he's only one guy with his wife and his daughter, there's only so much he can do. So I was surprised to see it show up, but I have it, and so thank you so much, Chiro Marchetti. I'm so grateful to you, I'm so grateful to my co-authors, and let's just go ahead and get started. So here is the bag as it came, dropped off by Mr. Mailman, and here are my handy dandy Swiss scissors. These are my good luck scissors that I bought for three Swiss francs in Migros in Bern and for some reason uh, they've always worked well for me and I always use them when opening important decks. Don't, maybe it's just an, you know, an idiosyncrasy on my part but those who know me are well aware that I have many idiosyncrasies. So, hi. Let's just go ahead and get started. Let's just cut the top here. It's a very hot day here today in Pittsburgh, so forgive me. It's unseasonably warm. It's nearly 80 degrees. And of course, in order to make this video, I've kind of had to shut myself in the one corner of my house. So forgive me if it's uh, the light's a little strange and changes as the clouds come, you know, back and forth. So here we go. We take this out of the white envelope. And here we see... The most beautiful deck. This is the famous handmade bag made by Maria Marchetti. It's beautiful. The quality of the fabric is incredible. It has such luster and gleam. It's a light, almost fluffy silk feeling. It feels like silk organza, but it's very sturdy. It's very beautifully made. It's just astonishing. The first thing that you'll notice about this, of course, is that unlike Chiro's traditional decks, which are always gilded, this one has a silver motif and it has a little silver string with beautiful black beads, all of which are hand done. And so I'm so grateful to Maria for that. That's really incredible. Silver is my favorite color anyway, as you can see, I always wear silver jewelry. So let's open the bag here. And as others have shown, we have it wrapped in black with a beautiful silver cord and a gorgeous bow. One pull and the package is free. Here we go. I want to be so careful to respect this delicate black tissue paper. And here we have the cards. You see, I have a personalized version, FB for Fortune Buchholz. Again, I'm very grateful to Chiro for making this for me. Uh, and I can't tell you how touched I am by it. So thank you so much, Chiro and the Marchetti family. Let's go ahead and take off the top 
card. This is the then reveals on the back side the reverse, the autographed card where you see Chiro signs his name in gold. Thank you so much, Chiro. It's his usual touch of gold, not completely missing from the deck for those of you who like his gold stuffs. Now we can see the various cards. Other people have already released some unboxing videos where they go through the cards and they compare them to the traditional kippers. And I'm not going to do that, right? But um, I will very carefully talk about the beauty and quality of these cards. So if you have Chiro Marchetti's limited edition Lenormand, right? I assume that many of you watching this video do. You'll immediately notice that this deck has slightly different qualities, even just holding it, right? Although it's the same size, really, um, it has a smoother finish on the sides. The paper is not um, all black on the edges the way that the Lenormand is, and or the one that I have is at least, because remember all of his limited edition Lenormands are slightly different in some way, right? Maybe they have a different colored ring, you know, this kind of thing, right? Um, and so this deck is much more, you know, uniform in that way. It has very smooth edges, no paper fuzz, like sometimes came with the original edition of the Lenormand. The, quality is really beautiful. It has that kind of light gloss finish, that sort of semi-gloss finish, which is so beautiful and it really makes the light that is within the cards seem to pop out and come alive, the same that you see in the Lenormand. So the cards seem to kind of have a glow, which I personally find, you know, really entrancing, but I realize that it may not be to everybody's taste, but I personally happen to love it. So I think that, you know, this is a total win here. So, of course, we have the, uh, the gentleman card, as I call it, right? He calls it the main male from the translation of the German, the Hauptperson. So, um, but I, you know, try to make the cards more amenable to the people that I read for, my clients, my sitters, my co-listeners. And um, as a result, I tend to use more informal language that are not strictly the names or titles of the cards, but but convey the feeling of the cards and their position in society at the time. So these are the beautiful cards. As I said, I'm not gonna go through them all because other people have, but you can just see the gorgeous quality of them. The detail of the printing is exquisite. So it's just, you know, really lovely. Even though it has a different feeling, a much different feeling than his Lenormand deck, it's not really the same steampunk feeling. This is a much more Victorian feeling. You know, the original Kipper cards, um, although they're printed, you know, at around the 1880s, 1890s, 1900, the subject, the visual rhetoric on the cards look back to the Biedermeier period in uh, Bavaria, right? And the clothes and all of that are from that time period, particularly around 1830 to 1832. Um, and those of you who, you know, are interested in the history have heard me talk about it on Suzanne Zitzel's beautiful Kipper Carden Forum hit her discussion group, which exists on Facebook. And if you're not a member of that, I highly recommend you go join Susan's group because it's an excellent, excellent group. And Suzanne does a wonderful job uh, moderating it and taking care of that. So again, I'm so grateful to her and I'm so grateful to all of the people in the Kipper Carden group who've helped, you know, who have helped me so much grow my own practice uh, with the Kipper. And I've been able to bring that to America, particularly here to Pittsburgh and also mix that with the Lenormand. Uh, so let's go ahead and just kind of look at another couple here, just so you can kind of see. You can see these are uh, totally updated to the Victorian time period. You can see from the clothing styles that uh, they are of a much later period. Uh, they're actually more from the 1875 to 1885 type period, as you can see by the Tissot style clothes, right? by the shoulder pads and all that. You can also see that um, there are some um, moments where we have advanced technology. You know, uh, Chiro's always associated with uh, technology. He has a fascination for these things. And of course, for a long time, Britain was the leader in this kind of technology. So you can hear, you can see that there's a telephone, right? Beautiful, again, you can see how the light that's in the back of the car it seems to glow out. I don't know if you can see this from my largely uh, top lit and side light uh, kitchen from the window here, but this is kind of where we are. Again, another example of a really beautiful and glowing card. 
I really, I really love that. So of course, you know, when Chero updated them, I think it was a very wise decision, right? Not very many people who are English speakers are familiar overall with the Biedermeier period that the original cards reference, right? So by the time the Kipper cards are published, you know, in the latter half of the 19th century towards the 1900s, right, Germany has already been reunified. Bavaria has been, you know, united to the rest. Uh, of you know Prussia and so I don't mean Germany's totally unified because of course you know Germany continued to evolve for a while and we didn't have like full German unification until East Germany you know connected back to West Germany but that's a long history we don't have to get into right but Bavaria was no longer its own independent kingdom and there was this movement towards you know a unified German identity and uh, the idea that there should be one German state for one German people. So, um, you know, this idea uh, was popular and this was something that the German people wanted, but at the same time, people had nostalgia for the good old days of the Biedermeier period, which was seen as a period of an almost an idol, right? And uh, a kind of sort of perfection when when you know Germany was on or Bavaria was on the up and up, the king Ludwig von, although conservative and politically oppressive, uh, did help the economy quite a bit. He was the first to get factories going. He was the first to start building the railroads for which Germany is still today so famous. So you know people have a lot of good associations. The furniture of that time is still highly prized, right? People then uh, were not so uh, interested in. Um, in romantic ideals, and by romantic I mean romance with a capital R as in the romantic movement, the famous German romanticism. People had been disillusioned by the Napoleonic Wars, which ravaged Bavaria, right? People felt torn between the Prussians and the French, but despite the, these difficulties, these politically difficulties, right, the middle class was able to use this period of calm and of economic stability to really rise and move away from the aristocratically dominated romantic period and really for the first time assert what we would call bourgeois culture and this is reflected in a number of ways in the furniture in the style of dress even in the literature people began to read Pushkin for example Pushkin was translated into German in 1823 people began to read a lot more poetry people began to read German folklore which was very popular at that time to try to learn more about themselves and about their culture so you know it was a very interesting time also because people were were less heavy they were more interested in in progressive ideas instead of the denial of the enlightenment that she saw during the high romantic period people began to become more interested in technology and to reincorporate uh, ideas from the enlightenment back into their daily life right so this we, this way we also see light farces become popular entertainment right as people begin to question the power of the church they largely still accept that role and these structures are forced upon them by the repressive and conservative King Ludwig von who restored the power of the church, who restored the power of the monarchy, right, who was in some ways kind of an absolutist. But it's still, they saw, you know, this kind of progress and naturally as the economy improves and the middle class rises, they, they call for more rights. And in the end, of course, the Biedermeier period ends in 1848 when we have the, the continent-wide revolution that sweeps all of Europe as people want parliamentary democracy as they call for constitutional monarchy. But this period from 1815 to 1848 is, you know, a very important period in German history, although we tend not to study it as English speakers as much as we can. It's very familiar to Germans and it's very important to them. And this is, you know, kind of where the Kipper is. It's looking back at this era, right? And it's look, it looks back with the nostalgia, right? But it's still part of the overall uh, theme of German cardamancy, the motifs in the uh, traditional Kipper deck, which of course Chiro's deck is not, come from popular culture. They come from previous games, right? Um, which you know I can talk about later and we'll talk about in another video or in my upcoming German interview which I'll tell you about later. So you know all of these things kind of come together in a very interesting cultural milieu so that the Biedermeier period is more than you know just sentimental paintings, uh, the poetry of the Baroness Annette uh, Drost Hulshoff and some very nice furniture with pretty feet and you know elegant backs, right? So um, 
we, we have to kind of reappraise the Biedermeier anew, and that's hard for us as, as Anglo-Saxons, but rather than just dive into all that, Tiro updated the deck to the more familiar Victorian period, and I think he did it very well. There are some things that you might miss, and I, you notice I've stopped on this card, Journey, right? So in the traditional deck, this shows a trip by carriage through the forest and over the hills, right? towards the beautiful spa town of Simbach, which is on the border of Austria. And that's something you know that people from Munich used to do. People in Bavaria, the wealthy people would, you know, pack up their carriage for the season and they would go off to the spa town to drink the water. Well, of course, by, you know, 1885 or, or so later, by the time of this deck, you know, the Simbach had just become like a stop on the train that you stopped, you had lunch, you remembered, ah, oh, Simbach, how charming. And then you went on into Austria, you know, as you changed trains, right? So, you know, there's a certain sense then of looking back at what was beautiful about that time. And when Simbach was a great and elegant little town that everybody went and took the waters at. And, you know, it's just very, it's very nice. But so we can see Chiro has updated this to be a steam train. Of course, this is, you know, the steam train that, you know, English people are so famous for. We've all seen this in a, in a million Victorian films of, you know, the heroes in Victoria Station with the giant steam train. It also because of the lighting and the sort of mystical, misty effect. It also kind of has a Harry Potter's getting on the train to Hogwarts kind of feeling, which is kind of cute, right? This is very nice. And of course, he's also updated other um, elements to be more familiar. This is a slot machine and not as in the traditional deck of croupier, but you know, this is just a, an interesting thing that I think makes it easier to understand. The, Right? This is the wealthy man here. I tend to call him the millionaire when I'm speaking to people about this deck. Message of concern to contrast with the earlier card, the pleasant message, right? Ch uh, Kipper has these balances, right? There's a pleasant message, right? There's a message of concern, right? There's a card that is fast, there's a card that is slow, there's a card of many, there's a card of few. So these kinds of things do exist in the Kipper system. Here's the lovers, very interesting update um, of the card, uh, which, you know, I happen to like a lot and works probably a lot better since many people don't get the reference of the original card, which is a German poem, and we'll talk about that later in another video, right? And then here's thoughts. This is a really useful update. The traditional card says his thoughts. Of course, that's just a requirement of German grammar. You know, you have to have an article uh, and you have to match the article to the gender of the noun. In English, we don't have gendered nouns, and so we don't have to, you know, uh, worry about translating it. But often when these cards are directly translated, the, the title card comes out, the title of the card comes out as his thoughts, making it seem as if it appears only to, you know, the gentleman card or about a man, when in fact that's not really what it means at all. It just kind of really means the thoughts or one's thoughts. But, you know, that's just a German grammatical problem, and that's just something that Chiro has solved here by just calling it thoughts, so I think that's really great. I happen to just love all these cards. Of course, this ch card, the child is his daughter, as usual. And I just really love this. I always look for these people uh, who are, you know, part of Chiro's world, and I feel like I enter into Chiro's world and Chiro's ideas uh, of what life could be like, you know, Chiro's kind of fantasy imagination world, which is a very delightful place. So I love to see his daughter, and hi, I realize she's been helping out with the Chiro family card enterprise, and so I want to express my gratitude to her too as well. This is the coffin card. Chiro's really updated this card and made it very cheerful and given it again this hopeful feeling so that there's no question of accidentally mistaking it for like the death card in Tarot, which so many people do. Beautiful house, very mystical and ominous, all kinds of adventure happening in this house. The beautiful family room, which I call drawing room in accordance with the time. The official person, of course this is originally the military person, and Chiro has actually drawn it as a British field marshal, right? So those of you who've been used to watching Pride and Prejudice or other British historical films, you'll immediately recognize this uniform as that of the British field marshal. And you get immediately the concept of the card, which is really probably much better than looking at the Biedermeier um, kind of, you know, card with his uniform, because you're like, who is this guy? Is he a postman? Is he a mailman? Well, he could be, right? But, um, you know, this makes it very clear that it's a military person, even though we just call him an official person. It's a beautiful, you know, version of the court, right? Uh, with the 
absolutely fabulous, you know, solicitor in his wig in front of the royal court. Beautiful thief card. I think it's much more telling than the traditional deck. And I love this card, High Honors, of course. Um, I think this is a card that some people who are not familiar with history may mistake. Of course, the highest honor that you can receive is the 21 gun salute. Right? So um, that's what this card depicts is the cannonade, right? You've just been knighted, you've gotten your medal, you've won the battle, and so you're gonna get your three guns fired seven times in the park. And this is something that, of course, uh, often happened in the Victorian times in Great Britain. The 21 gun salute has an ancient history, comes from naval history, and of course, Britain is a great naval power. I think actually the 21 gun cannonade was invented by Samuel Pepys, the famous. Um, English uh, literary personage, you know, who also I believe served for a, a time as, you know, the British uh, Minister of the Navy. Um, and if you want to read more about, you know, history before the Great London Fire or around the time of the Great London Fire, you can always read Pepys' Diary, which I think is pretty much a, a standard um, thing that is still studied if, for those of you who have literature degrees. And I know that many people in the card community are very highly educated and do in fact have deg advanced degrees in literature, psychology, and culture. So I'm, you know, I'm just going to make that reference and I know that all of you will get it. Uh, so that's really great. And of course, I love this card, Great Fortune, my favorite. Gold like my hair. Thank you so much. Anyway, so I'm very happy to have this. I know this video has gone a little longer maybe than I, I wanted and I could talk a lot more about the cards and I will talk a lot more about the cards. Uh, so thank you so much Chair McKetty. I really enjoyed working on the companion document with him and my co-authors. It was a great privilege and I'm very grateful. So as you go through and get this deck or order this deck, I want to encourage all of you to read the companion document very carefully two or three times and, and look at it you know, and really um, absorb the meaning of the cards to experience the feeling of the Kipper, which has its special charm. Uh, I call that the Kippergeist. Uh, and I really um, want to bring that to you in my upcoming videos. Uh, I used a lot of reference books when I um, wrote about this deck, and I just want to show you a couple of them before I end. Here's a very famous art history book. This is called Biedermeier's Luck and End. And this is an enormous, as you can see, I can barely hold it with two hands, art history book that's a complete discussion of the art, culture, uh, material, and literary um, of the Biedermeier period. And you can find many of the cards in the Biedermeier deck reference this kind of sentimental imagery, which was then popular. For example, if you look at the girl here, the way she's dressed in this cover, you can see that she actually resembles the traditional card, you know, the convent girl, right? Uh, the, the girl, the traditional card of rich girl, right? The young maiden who's a rich girl. She's a convent girl and she's just gotten out of the convent and she's ready to get married. And you, you see her here, right, in the same kind of dress. Right, so this is how we know the time period of the cards, the cards, what they're referencing. And you know, so you, there's a lot of discussion that we will have about this, including how some of the cards reference other famous paintings, for example, Kipper 28, Expectation or Waiting, which references a famous painting by Moritz von Schwind, who was at that time, as I said, a very popular sentimental painter. So, of course, whenever we talk about these cards, we also have to look at the late Dr. Detlef Hoffman's uh, Varsakarten catalog. He held a wonderful exhibition in 1972, and it was the first really serious kind of discussion of these cards and how their place in German cultural history and how they developed from previous games, right? So this is, this is a book that we'll talk about a lot. So if you find a copy of this online, yes, it is in German, but the pictures are really worth it. It's a fabulous buy and I recommend that everybody who's interested in Kipper and Lenormand get this as, you know, ASAP, if you can find a copy. It can be a kind of hard to find, but I believe the museum, the German National Playing Card Museum, still does sell copies. I also was able to, uh, excuse my, for some reason a truck has gone by and my camera's shaking, so forgive me for that. Um, that's how heavy these books are, as I plump them on the table and a truck comes by, it goes, oh, so forgive me for that. Uh, then I also got to speak to a very famous a professor at Catholic University. He wrote this beautiful book about romanticism and literature in the Biedermeier period, specifically what plays 
uh, novels, poems, and books people were reading and how that very much affected women's culture. So, um, you know, he's a, a professor at Catholic University in Washington, D.C. He himself is quite Catholic, but that's appropriate because, of course, Bavaria in the Biedermeyer period was devoutly Catholic, and that was um, a force that the King Ludwig von elevated. He returned a lot of power to the Catholic Church. So um, the interplay between this growing bourgeois culture of literature, uh, art, sentimentality, all of this interplays with the needs of the Catholic Church and the growing Catholic power in a very fascinating way, right? So this is something that this book talks about. Then, of course, I talked a lot about the German poetress, Annette von Drost Holzhoff, and this is a beautiful monograph of her poetry, recently translated. I was very fond of this, and I use this a lot. Um, primarily because, you know, she reveals the interior thoughts of people, particularly of women at that time, and that's something that's very hard for non-German speakers, uh, people who can't read German, much more or less the old-fashioned black lettering, and don't have access to old letters and things. This is a great way to see the insight into the psychology of the people who'd be using these cards and what their concerns are, what their hopes are, how, how they felt. And then, of course, there's a whole bunch of traditional German books that talk about how to read the Kipper in the traditional and normal German system, you know, and these are books by, uh, you know, Suzanne Zitzel, by Kirsten Kolb, by Regula Elizabeth Feichter, and of course, I just happen to have this one. Right, so these are some of the books that I uh, rely upon and that I used when referencing and writing um, my work for uh, Kiro as my part of his companion document. Of course, there's so much more that we can talk about, and I hope that we will in the future. So thank you so much. I really want, uh, again, to thank everybody. The response to these cards has been overwhelming, and it's been so appreciative. It's been um, so overwhelming. I'm just so happy that people are becoming interested in the Kipper and are awaking, as I said, to the Kipper guys, to the spirit of the Kipper, to its psychological and novelistic qualities. And um, later we'll go on in three or four more videos and we'll talk more about that. So until then, thank you so much for watching. I'm sorry for the length of this video. And uh, I'll try to get it up in one piece, but I may have to cut it in half. So thank you so much and have a great day.